Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to the Georgetown AMSRO meeting. Um, we're super fortunate tonight to have Dr. Jonathan Clark with us um, giving a presentation about the neurological changes associated with space flight. Um, a little background on Dr. Clark. He is a board certified neurologist and aerospace medicine physician. His professional interests focus on the neurologic effects of extreme environments, crew resilience, and crew survival in space. Um, he's been involved with so many super cool things associated with space medicine throughout his career. Um, I'd like to highlight just a few. Um, so Dr. Clark worked at NASA Johnson Space Center from 1997 to 2005 and was a space shuttle crew surgeon on six shuttle missions. He was the medical director of the Red Bull Stratus Project and a few years later was the lead flight surgeon and medical advisor for the Strat-X Space Dive Project. He's also a space medicine consultant um, for commercial space companies, including Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, and Space Perspective. If any questions come up during the presentation, go ahead and put them just in the chat, or you can directly message me, and we can um, hopefully have a few minutes at the end to get those answered for you. All right, so Dr. Clark, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Claire. Um, well, it's, it's just such an honor to be a part of uh, teaching and passing the torch to the next generation. And so I look at this as really uh, not so much me uh, educating you as me kind of uh, passing the torch and giving you some of the perspectives of some of our challenges. So I'm going to talk about the neurologic effects of spaceflight, but it's going to cover some broader areas as well as you'll as we'll get into. Um, I like to start with the, our learning objectives, which are to understand how the nervous system is affected by the space environment. We'll talk about some specific neurologic syndromes associated with different phases of uh, space flight. And then the real thing that we're concerned about acutely is what are the performance effects? And obviously the nervous system is extremely uh, valuable to this, uh, um, this endeavor. So, um, Oh, wow, that's weird. It cut out some of my slides. Hang on for a sec. Um, so gravity is one of the key um, features of our environment. We've adapted to a variety of uh, other uh, extreme environments, including altitude and thermal uh, challenges, and even managed to work under pressure underwater. Um, but gravity is something that we've been always exposed to as long as we've been on the earth, except for transient perturbations that we might get flying an acrobatic flight or parabolic flight, uh, or if we rode a centrifuge. Um, and although we can adapt to it very well, one thing I've noted in, in some of the research studies is that fetal development is very adversely affected in the absence of gravity. And so it may represent a challenge to us from, from a standpoint of a cross, um, you know, species uh, travel to uh, Mars and having children there because we're, we're, we're uh, our development has been over the, the many hundreds of thousands of years of uh, human evolution that um, gravity has always been present. So I like to start out with um, where we are, and this I just compiled this uh, last month, which was basically um, we've had, um, you know, obviously we've had a lot of suborbital flights, but I'm just counting orbital flights. We're just shy of 600, and I was kind of shocked to see that 90% of it was male, um, even though we've uh, incorporated women early in the space program, particularly in Russia. And in the US, um, you know, after um, the shuttle program started, um, it's still only 10% women. But the good news is that the astronaut classes now are almost 50% women, representing our, you know, obviously our population better. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that of this, um, it's about 157 um, uh, or 161,000. Um, crew, crew years in space, which is, is um, on the order of um, 57,000 um, crew days plus or minus. 
And in the time we've spent in space, we've only spent 250 crew days in deep space. By that, I mean outside a low Earth orbit. So the uh, environmental challenges of deep space radiation are really something we have very little insight into. We have, however, flown people long enough that they could have gone to Mars uh, and back. Um, and a mission like that would probably on the short side of things be 650 days on the long side of things, you know, over a thousand days. Um, but we still have to, uh, we've never had somebody who spent a single mission duration any longer than 14 months. And that was a Russian physician, Valery Polyakov. So all of our organ systems adapt differently um, to different environments, what be it a low oxygen state or low environmental pressure uh, or various thermal uh, uh, challenges. But in, in the microgravity adaptation, um, we clearly see a very broad spectrum of adaptive um, processes in the different organ systems. And in the nervous system, um, it's a very rapidly adapting system, whereas um, bone, uh, muscle mass, are very long adapting systems. So um, the nervous system fortunately adapts very quickly or relatively quickly um, and then reaches a, a homeostatic baseline, but other organ systems take much longer. And um, if you look at the bottom of this graph, the longest time frame on here is six months. And even though we've flown people that are in excess of a year and we've had cumulative people in the in the several hundred uh, days in space, we're still, um, we're, we really don't have a good idea of the long duration effects uh, of these adaptive time constants. Um, but it, it's no surprise that the long, long um, adapting systems like bone, muscle, and then our response to radiation, like our immune system, are going to be very long adapting systems, and that's where we're going to we're going to need continued ex experience in long duration spaceflight. The other thing is that when we return back to our nominal condition on Earth, or with uh, going from weightlessness to one uh, G, there's an adaptive time constant, and that time constant is, in general, um, it's different. And uh, for example, um, you may lose a certain amount of bone mass and it may take six months to, uh, for that to occur, but to readapt um, and get back to a, a healthy baseline, it may take three times as long to recover. And that's a lesson we often see in uh, rehabilitation after somebody's been in the hospital, particularly if they've been on ambulatory in a bed, uh, which is a very bad state to be in. Um, we see a very rapid loss in cardiovascular conditioning and bone and muscle strength. And those things can be so bad that if, if once somebody is prolonged at prolonged bed rest, they may never, never get back to a healthy, um, at least through their, their pre-morbid baseline. I like to divide the hazards of space into different groups. There's a, there's a different one that NASA uses, um, but this is the one I like to use, which is basically to divide it into the, uh, the actual space environment, the vehicle environment, and the mission architecture, or what I call the space mission environment. And each, each of these um, constraints of environments has certain uh, influences on our adaptiveness and our uh, ability to perform adequately in space. Um, imagine what it's like where you are totally dependent on the life support system that you take with you. If you have a fire, you can't open the door and let the, the bad fumes out. You, you, you know, doing so would be uh, very hazardous to your health. So this is really a, an extreme, extreme environment, and we can get some experience with it in analog situations, both from a phys uh, physical environment standpoint and also a um, behavioral standpoint. And I've been quite involved in quite a bit of uh, analog environment testing, including um, Devon Island, uh, parabolic flight, um, and uh, the uh, long duration 60 day bed rest study we just finished it uh, in Germany where we were using artificial gravity head down uh, as a countermeasure to the 
fluid shifts and head down to, from head down tilt. The other thing is, particularly for neurologic function, is that um, if you've ever ridden a carnival ride, you know, where you've been on one of those spinning rooms um, and you try to touch your finger uh, fingers together or do some coordinated movement, um, it, you, you notice right away that 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 is very, very, very challenging. Um, the other thing is because we use artificial vision environments, synthetic vision, augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera, that the visual motion environments can also be um, a, a factor in our performance. And then the other thing, because we use various countermeasures, both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical countermeasures, those countermeasures themselves, particularly uh, psychoactive CNS modulating compounds like analgesics and um, sedative hypnotics for sleep and antiemetics for motion sickness, that those can also be, uh, you know, have effects on the nervous system. So much so can, are we concerned about it that we test all the drugs that any crew member would use on a, in a ground-based setting so we know that they don't have a serious adverse effect. And then the other thing is that uh, it, because we're totally dependent on life support systems and uh, the accumulation of various environmental toxins, um, such as carbon dioxide and heavy metals, uh, can be a factor. And, and we, as I'll get into later, we have very little insight into the deep space radiation effects. Um, this is Jerry Leninger, who had a, uh, there were been a number of fires on Mir. Um, this was one where a solid fuel uh, uh, oxygen candle, very similar to what you have in aircraft when the, uh, the masks come down if you lose cabin pressure. Um, it's an exothermic uh, reaction that releases oxygen. And in the process, it's very, um, it, can, it has a very high temperature. And this was one of the um, combustion events that happened in space. Um, in fact, uh, we've had quite a few in the um, pr prelude to the um, ISS on Salyut and Mir, um, we've had them on the shuttle program and we've had uh, several on the ISS. Usually they are some kind of electronic avionics uh, combustion event. Um, but as a result of that, crew have been exposed to toxic environments, including carbon monoxide, ethylene glycol, which is a, le a coolant used, so essentially the antifreeze like you use in your car, uh, but leaking out of its, um, out of its um, um, system. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of, of um, metabolism. And we've had numerous scenarios where we've had elevated carbon dioxide. And then we've also had uh, the introduction of um, toxins that were um, propellants that leak back inside the, from outside the, the uh, capsule. We have spacewalks that uh, where crew members get sprayed with ammonia from uh, the co uh, coolant lines and they have to bake outside and let all that ammonia dissipate before they can come back in. Real concerning, as we found out, was the um, evolution of toxic chemicals in water. Obviously, you need water, uh, usually a liter or two a day. And if the water treatment system or water recycling system is um, 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 not performing well, you can have the buildup of heavy metals and, and uh, aldehydes. Well, the biggest challenge we face is immediately uh, upon launch is the uh, uh, gravito-inertial forces. Usually it takes um, eight and a half minutes to get to low earth orbit um, and you have to accelerate from being essentially recumbent or flat to 1,700, 17,500 miles an hour. And that occurs in eight minutes. So you can imagine the G-forces it takes to get there. In addition to that, there's a quite a bit of uh, vibration from the rockets themselves, particularly if they're solid um, rocket motors are used. Um, so uh, just a quick synopsis of uh, that we'll get into a little bit further on is throughout all phases of space flight, there are various effects on the nervous system. Uh, during ascent, because of the amount of vibration and acceleration loads, um, you get a phenomenon called oscillopsia, which is basically an inability to hold steady gaze. Now, this is seen in pathologic conditions like um, um, vestibular disorders, such as uh, positional vertigo, 
or vestibular neuronitis. It's also seen in multiple sclerosis. But if you want to rep replicate it uh, on Earth, um, when I was teaching neurology, I would say, okay, cover one eye and take your uh, finger, put it on the lateral part of the open eye globe and just wiggle your eye around. And what you'll see there is the visual uh, distortion of, uh, that, that occurs from the globe itself moving. That is oscillopsia. And it's virtually impossible to read displays if um, that occurs. Uh, you can color code them and you can make them larger fonts, but it's very, very difficult to read small, uh, small font gauges, whether they're uh, digital or analog. Dysmetria refers to the inability to make a coordinated uh, um, movement. In other words, if you're trying to reach or grasp something like a switch, um, your hand pass points, and this is sometimes seen in vestibular uh, and cerebellar disorders. On orbit, there's a whole bunch of stuff. We'll talk about motion sickness, space headache, and uh, perceptual effects and uh, intravehicular disorientation because they all have consequences to crew performance. During the entry phase, just as we had to under a altered gravitonertial field going to space, during reentry, we are going from zero G back to one G, but we go through a high G transition state. And the same phenomena that affect us on ascent also occur on reentry, and that's called the entry and landing syndrome. And then post flight, we can see wide effects on neurologic function, uh, such as ataxia and disequilibrium, and the perturbed eye movements. Um, essentially, uh, the tests we would do to de determine whether somebody is ready to go back to um, activities of daily living is a field sobriety test. And then some unusual uh, phenomenon that are sometimes seen in the clinical realm, uh, mal de Um, People go on a cruise for, say, a, a period of a week or two, and, and they come back. And when they get back to Earth uh, or get back to land, they have, uh, they, they have adapted to their sea legs, and they can't adapt back to the terrestrial environment. Believe it or not, that can be quite um, problematic. And then a really unusual phenomenon I'll talk about is this thing that I've uh, um, had the opportunity to interview crew members on called G-State flashbacks. Right off the bat, getting to space is very uh, prone to motion sickness. And amazingly, it doesn't happen in um, people that necessarily have seasickness or car sickness or air sickness. Um, this is a cruise uh, uh, with their very uh, well-built NASA um, um, barf bags. Um, it wasn't a problem until we started having larger volumes inside the vehicle. And so we didn't see it in Mercury and Sky, uh, Mercury and uh, uh, Gemini because they were very small um, habitable volumes. But we did see it starting in Apollo. And, and then as the vehicles got larger, particularly Skylab, which was quite large, and in the shuttle, um, both the flight deck and the mid deck and the uh, laboratory modules, we started seeing higher incidences. Roughly about two thirds of crew member will get effects and um, probably 10 to 15% are severely debilitated by it. The onset is quite quick after reaching orbit and uh, usually lasts for a period of a couple of days. It's uh, such a concern that we won't do spacewalks on an emergency unless it's a, it's a real serious emergency for the first uh, couple of days unless the crew member has flown in space before and has not had motion sickness. Because not having motion sickness on your, after your first flight is the best predictor of not getting it on your subsequent flights. All the other things that you might consider, high performance aircraft time as pilots, males versus females, age, uh, or even uh, previous experience uh, does not guarantee you won't get it. The biggest predictor is if you got motion sick on the first flight, you have a over two thirds, three quarters chance of getting it on your second flight. After long durations adapted to the microgravity environment, all crew members inevitably will get motion sick on day one, returning from uh, the space station. And, uh, and when I say that they're in the severe to, um, you know, uh, very severe category. 
and then over a period of a couple of hours, uh, half a day or so, their their um, sickness is dropped by a, a, you know about half as as bad, and by 24 hours, it's it's into the mild to, to moderate range. But this is for crew members that have spent usually it's three to six months, but we're starting to go more longer missions, 11, 12 months. Uh, this is a Soyuz lifeboat and a Progress resupply ship. The Soyuz and the Progress look very similar. Um, talk a little bit about space headaches. This is something that just came out and this was published uh, in, a, in a very scientifically valid uh, survey. And I was kind of shocked about this, that this that the headaches were not necessarily associated with motion sickness, because I often thought, well, maybe that's why they're having headaches, but this study established that they're unlikely, to, it's unlikely to be related to motion sickness. And the majority of headaches are nonspecific headaches as opposed to the throbbing headache or the band-like headache of tension. Um, but this is uh, this has set the framework that we are seeing um, headaches. And the interesting thing is, because it was mostly males in the survey, um, that usually headaches are more common in women on Earth. And there, I'm not sure exactly why, maybe partly hormonal related or what, but the, in this study, it was the majority of the people were that were, uh, um, that had headaches were men. Again, that's something we'll have to see what, uh, how that plays out. Perhaps one of the biggest predictors of headache is the higher CO2 concentrations. And um, we'll see um, CO2 concentrations of, um, you know, a couple of uh, millimeters of mercury, whereas on Earth, it's going to be about, you know, 10 to 20 times lower. And, and uh, the, the thing is, we generate carbon dioxide as a metabolic byproduct. The more activity, like exercise we do, the higher that CO2 level gets. But we're often limited on how we get rid of it, usually with some kind of CO2 scrubber that can either be a chemical absorption or a, um, a molecular sieve that absorbs it and then you dump it into space. But typically, um, we would set the limit to scrub Initially, it was set to um, uh, five millimeters of mercury was, was what they would target trying to keep the carbon dioxide levels down. And that's probably, you know, 20 times higher than what we would see on Earth. And then what they found is that by reducing it even just to four millimeters, by running the scrubbers a little bit longer or a little bit harder, it, it, it drastically reduced the CO2 levels and the incidence of headaches. But you can still see that the difference, if you look on this graph, that the incidence of headaches uh, at five millimeters of mercury is somewhere on the order of, uh, you know, uh, six to 10 percent. And on the just going to four millimeters, just drop, it drops at a couple of percentage points, but it's still quite um, common. I'll just briefly mention, I'm not a, a psychiatrist, so, but as a neurologist, we have about a third of our board training is in psychiatry. But I wanted to mention just briefly that there's been a lot of behavioral health, neurobehavioral effects in space. The one that's got us most concerned is this um, impaired cognitive performance. And these are terms that astronauts have actually used. Space fog, space dementia, mental viscosity. That was a, a French guy who was much more eloquent speaker. Um, it was like their brain was having to work through oatmeal. It, it, nothing was intuitive. This has profound effects on uh, very complex um, crew, crew actions, such as following checklists. And there's been numerous times that crew have uh, failed to follow checklist items. And that's resulted in various things. For example, on spacewalks, we've lost over 60 tools or cameras or bags over the course of, uh, you know, our spaceflight experience. And crew are never, uh, they're always supposed to tether their items. And so these highly trained EVA crew members that do in spacewalks, forgetting to tether a bag or a, or a, a tool um, is, is a quite a concern or an alarm. We've also had some pretty bad um, behavioral events, including a uh, grief reaction. There was a payload specialist that became uh, despondent um, 
On Mir, there have been both homicidal and suicidal ideations, conflicts between crew on board the space on uh, various space vehicles, and conflict between the mission control on the ground and the crew on orbit. Um, so these are some of the things that you know we also have to take into consideration. The vision, the 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 eye is an actually a part of the nervous system, and um, it, besides the fact that it's very a vision is a very important element of what we do, uh, we are really concerned about some of the visual effects, particularly um, deep space radiation, as I'll get into, and then I'll talk about this uh, phenomenon of visual impairment in papilledema or optic disc swelling, which is um, actually our one of the top. Um, neurologic uh, concerns for uh, long duration space flight. But just to show you that this is a list of various uh, visual complaints in both the shuttle program, which the longest shuttle flight was just shy of 18 days. Most of them were in the 10 days to two week category. But about 20% of crew would have problems with um, vision. Um, and uh, notably, specifically, uh, decrease in near visual acuity. And the reason that's a concern is that you have to read checklists, which are, you know, essentially like at arm's length. So this change in visual acuity, we never really fully understood until we started looking at it more closely in the shuttle, in the space station program, where over 50% of the crew have this problem of decreased near visual acuity. Now, obviously, we get changes in uh, visual acuity as we age, the so-called presbyopic um, change in <coughs> the lens uh, ability to uh, modify its shape. Um, one of the deep, uh, one of the biggest uh, concerns we have, and, and I would say the unknown unknown, is deep space radiation. Of that, you know, um, uh, 57,000 days in space, only 250 of those days are in deep space. And I want to share with you a little uh, story about this. Um, if you look at, um, in, in all the crew experience this on orbit, uh, they're, uh, when their eyes are closed, they're getting ready for sleep, they'll see bright light flashes. I actually had a video, but in the interest of time, I'm not showing it. Those light flashes occur in the areas where um, high energy particles are striking their retinal photoreceptors and causing a, um, a flash that is perceived by the crew member. There's an area in the South Atlantic where there's a deviation of the protective magnetic fields called the South Atlantic anomaly. And they also, because the magnetic fields bend in at the pole, um, the, the magnetic fields are less prominent on the uh, north and south pole. So we see those um, retinal flashes at high latitudes where the magnetic field is uh, bending inward, and we see them at the South Atlantic anomaly. What also happens in a, is, is also a deep, uh, is a concern of deep space is that um, we are flying with very complex computer systems now, particularly high density integrated circuits. And um, computers um, are monitored for their accuracy and they have the, a, a thing called a single event upset, which is like a bit flip where it changes its polarity in the circuit. And um, the, if you look at the where bit flips occur, it's in the exact same area as the, le the, the high energy retinal fla flash uh, phenomenon is seen. So if it's messing up the high density integrated circuits and it's messing up the retinas, what's it doing to the deep brain structure itself? This is a big, big area of concern. Um, like I had mentioned to you, the, 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 the top threat that we're facing right now in long duration spaceflight in low earth orbit is the spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome. And it's a, um, it's uh, right now as it, it's, it's only been uh, first evident about 15 years ago. And that was the first crew member. And I remember when that first case happened, it was like, well, it was probably just an off anomaly. It wasn't, and then the second case, then the third case, and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're up to, you know, over 50 cases. Um, so, Right now, we see it in about 
um, half to a third of uh, to two thirds of crew members. And only, we haven't done lumbar punctures on all of them, but there's been indication that there has been an elevated increased intracranial pressure. Because if you look in the um, globe uh, on the fundus exam, you'll see uh, optic disc edema, choroidal folds, other f features as well. And this is, uh, the, the, these are photos from astronauts. Choroidal folds are buckling of the posterior um, uh, portion of the eye. And that can cause distortion of the uh, visual imagery. And you can see optic disc swelling. And so in some cases, it's unilateral, and, and it, may, it may be um, you know, different in one eye than the other. When you look at imaging studies, either using uh, ultrasound, which is done on orbit, or MRI, what you see is, is a dilated optic nerve sheath and you see uh, buckling of the optic nerve, almost as if it's uh, gotten, a, it's a high pressure hose that's twisted around. And the reason that there's change in visual acuity uh, and reduced near visual acuity is because the globe itself loses its sphericity and it actually is distorted and it's called globe flattening. When the globe flattens, it moves the focal length closer to the, um, or, or it, it moves this, the, it's the focal length, the focal length of the lens stays the same, but the globe itself where the energy is being picked up is, is displaced. And that's the results in this thing called hyperopic shift, uh, which requires a, a, um, a plus lens to correct. And here is a, one, one of the early studies done by uh, on Expedition 10 with Leroy Child using an, uh, an ultrasound probe that was available. We now are using smaller ultrasounds and we're also doing optical coherence tomography, which is a clinical test. And uh, sure enough, we're seeing uh, retinal nerve fiber layer uh, thickening uh, from uh, optic disc engorgement. And this was the operational impact of a hyperopic shift. You're having to read checklists. And um, we have crew members that have not been able to read their checklist. And that obviously could be a very serious situation. What's happened now is they start bringing uh, um, glasses that you can uh, adjust um, the uh, prescription on. Uh, they're called space adaptation glasses. And they're used now as a countermeasure to it. The problem is that there's something underlying as to why the globe is flattening, and it may be this increased pressure. These are just some examples of what you see uh, with ultrasound. You measure the optic nerve sheath a couple of millimeters behind the uh, uh, retina, and uh, there's measurements that are being uh, calculated. But if you look at this optic nerve sheath, Clearly, one, you can see the loss of sphericity of the back of the, uh, the globe and also the tortuous optic nerve sheath. You can really see the uh, tortuosity of it with an MRI after landing. A lot of causes for it. Originally, it was thought to be due to a high salt diet or obviously CO2 as a vasodilator in the brain. Um, but we see fluid shifts and also a recently discovered uh, phenomenon the brain itself has a, um, um, a basically a, a, a sewer system that works at night during slow wave sleep called the glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system has been implicated in the buildup of uh, toxins such as tau and beta amyloid, which are implicated in chronic traumatic encephalopathy and Alzheimer's disease and other uh, maladies. And so this is a very, very hot topic now. Um, virtually any of these things can contribute to the, the uh, neuroocular syndrome, but its effect on the glymphatic system. And now there have been recent cases of venous stasis on looking at ul using ultrasound of the internal uh, of the uh, uh, internal jugular vein. They've seen uh, venous stasis and in some cases of uh, actual clot formation. Here you look at, this is Peggy Whitson, our long duration US flyer. She has over 667 days in space. Here she is on the ground in space. Look at how swollen her eyelids are and her facial wrinkles are all gone. And this persists throughout the mission, even though you, uh, you, know, you pee off excess water. So we've uh, had a very robust program of brain imaging, and this is uh, the overall summary of it is that there's been an upward shift 
of the cerebral hemispheres, there's been uh, some decrease in frontotemporal volume and gray matter changes and increase in ventricular size. In this photo here, uh, this is the top two, A and B are uh, long duration crews. A is pre-flight and B is post-flight. And the short duration shuttle crew member pre-flight in C and post-flight in D, you can see that the, um, the uh, uh, grooves of the sulci are, are very uh, compressed and the head, the brain itself looks very different post-flight than it did pre-flight. And sure enough, and this is a, a, a photo of between, this is a, a sagittal view of the brain. What you'll see here is pre-flight to post-flight, you'll see this shift in the, uh, the brain upwards. Now that may not seem like much of a problem, but it definitely can, uh, there, there's a superior sagittal vein, there's venous structures, there's a lot of things that can, be, that can happen, um, not the least of which is ordinarily we do not have this headward fluid shift. In the analog studies, when we do strict bed rest, we are now seeing similar findings to the space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, including optic disc edema, globe flattening, uh, et cetera. This was a study done on cosmonauts that showed increased uh, CSF volume in the lower portions in the, in the, in the uh, lateral ventricles and the uh, basal or cisterns and decrease in gray matter in certain areas of the brain itself, which are um, concerning. And that's why we're gonna be having to put a little more attention on this. Uh, we'll talk about some of the performance effects from the neuro neurologic effects of spaceflight, primarily affecting, you know, um, integration in the, in the vestibular system. Um, rendezvous and docking is a very dangerous maneuver. Um, piloted uh, reentry and landing, and also doing spacewalks. Um, right after you get into microgravity, it's a very common phenomenon to feel like you're flipped upside down, um, like you're a bat. Um, and um, what happens is if you close your eyes, you get the sense that you're hanging from your feet, which isn't a particularly a problem, except that it can be somewhat disorienting and contribute to your intervehicular disorientation. Basically, we, uh, on, when we are on Earth, um, ground is, gravity is, is pointing downward, is pulling us down. And so the earth itself is where down is. But in space, there is no gravity vector. So you have three choices. You can either, uh, down is either where your feet are, down is where the earth is, which you may or may not be able to see, or down is where the vehicle floor is. And the problem is on um, the space station, every surface of the uh, cylindrical uh, modules are used, so there is no uh, vertical uh, up or down. Every uh, whatever platform side you're working on is is now down. So this uh, reorientation illusion can be problematic, um, and it also um, can contribute to a concern about being uh, lost in space. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, the other thing is, uh, when you get past about 90 degrees, you can no longer read facial expressions. And there's been a number of studies that have shown that. So we often communicate non-verbally. It's been very disruptive during COVID wearing masks, but in space, you may not be able to read the verbal, uh, the non-verbal cues that you ordinarily get unless you're facing each other in the same orientation. So this phenomenon really became evident when we were docking the space shuttle to Mir because Mir had a much more three-dimensional structure and uh, crew, the shuttle crews would get on board and they would be totally lost as to where was the shuttle. If they needed to uh, get out, get back to the space shuttle in an emergency, they couldn't even tell which way to go. Now we've, on ISS, we've had similar concerns. And so we have placards basically pointing to the escape, the exit for your vehicle. Now that we have both the Soyuz and the uh, Crew Dragon, they're gonna be on different areas of the ship. So you have to know which is your specific lifeboat if there's an emergency. I'll point out some perceptual errors. This is kind of interesting. In the absence of gravity, if you uh, point to a target that you've remembered and close your eyes, 
and uh, your point to uh, you know uh, center left right up and down, um, um, you are you are invariably biased downward in microgravity. So in this test, pre-flight. Um, obviously, uh, with eyes closed, you don't get as accurate a, a shot picture as you do with eyes open. But in flight, um, even with eyes open, you're deviating, uh, your shot picture is down. And with your eyes closed, if you're told to point straight ahead or up, down, left, or right, look at all of, all of them are deviated down. Interestingly enough, if you go into a high G environment, you displace your target shot group upward. So if you're asked to point straight ahead, you will uh, you know, be deviated down in microgravity and deviated up during a high G uh, exposure. And where this becomes a problem is that you use, uh, you have to make switch throws in all the vehicles, either, whether it's the Crew Dragon or the Soyuz. And in the shuttle had uh, one of these things that was called a swizzle stick or gra grasp extender. And um, what it could do is it could it could confuse you because you would not maybe grab the right switch. It was it was not where you thought it would be. This is a phenomenon called EVA acrophobia or height vertigo, and it's been very common in the shuttle program, particularly when the payload bay was on, um, basically facing the Earth. And the crew members would describe having to grab the, uh, the you know the the um, the uh, transit line moving out to the work site, like, you know, with iron grip because you were afraid of falling. And I have some videos of that, but I won't have time to show it. Well, let's talk a little bit about coming back to earth. We got to go through a G vector uh, uh, landing. Um, this was, a sh this is uh, taken a couple of years ago. Now this, uh, because it was considered a national resource, it's now housed in a fully enclosed uh, building. So you can no longer see it. So we talked about the uh, entry and landing syndrome, um, which is, uh, you know, ocular stability disruption. So you won't be able to see as well. And also you, your coordination is going to be affected. And then disequilibrium and ataxia is a problem, particularly for crews that have to do an emergency egress after landing. And then this earth readaptation syndrome. And we'll talk a little bit about this. This was a study done in the shuttle coming back during re-entry. And the crew member is uh, has a target um, in front of him. This was done on the mid decks. It wasn't, it wasn't done by the pilots. And what they were supposed to do is to is to um, fixate on a on a on a target. And um, and then they were going to make a head movement, an up or down head movement. So when you make a uh, if you turn your head up. And, it, and, um, and you maintain gaze on a target, your eye has to deviate down. And this is an ocular uh, phenomenon called the visual vestibular ocular reflex. And it's used to stabilize gaze. So if the, in the crew member, their eyes are open and they're looking at a target in front of them, it may be in any one of these five areas, center, up, down, left, or right. Um, but when you, when you turn your head up, your eyes deviate down. Look what happens during the actual reentry G force. The, um, the eye does not make it an adequate corrective eye movement for that period of time when the uh, vision is removed. So this implies that uh, the vestibular system in a high G environment after a microgravity exposure could be a, a potential problem. And to demonstrate some of the concerns we have, the shuttles. Uh, made 100, there were 135 uh, shuttle flights and 133 landings. And um, the landings are done by experienced test pilots. They have to have a thousand shuttle training aircraft uh, runs in the uh, modified Gulfstream, and they have to uh, be a uh, fly in the right seat and for um, first and demonstrate that they have no vestibular motion sickness effects. So we plotted out the shuttle landing performance over those 130 plus missions. And what you see here is normally the shuttle lands at about 200 knots plus or minus five or 10. So right around here is the, is the normal landing weight. It changes a little bit depending on the, the, the vehicle weight, but in general, uh, it's right around here. And what you see here is 
a, a flight rule limit what was set at 214 knots touchdown speed and a tire speed limit of 225. That's really fast. And look at how many, these are experienced test pilots with a thousand shuttle training flights and one previous flight. And look at how poor their performance is, both too high and also too low. And if you're any of your pilots, you know that flying uh, too slow, you can stall the vehicle. And sure enough, this uh, um, faster touchdown speed happens with longer missions. And uh, that was a concern as we were one, at one time when I was at NASA, we were actually talking about flying 30 day shuttle missions. Now you take this second parameter, which is equally important is how hard you hit. So you have how fast your wheels touch down and how, uh, what your vertical velocity at touchdown is. And um, if you've ever flown an airliner by a Navy pilot, you can tell that those guys like I myself was a Naval aviator without the vertical velocity at touchdown, you, you want to get the vehicle hard on the deck, but in general, the shuttle, you do not want to do that. So nominally, you, ta you target about one to two feet per second. But look at how many exceeded the red and the, uh, and the flight rule limits, quite a number. Sure enough, that also higher velocities at touchdown occurred. This was uh, one of the, uh, look at that one. That was, that was almost sheared the landing gear off. So uh, and this is just another plot of, you know, acceptable, you know, desirable and, and not acceptable. So here's the post-flight walk around after a shuttle lands, uh, the crew comes out. This is, I was a flight surgeon for one of these missions. This was STS-99. The crew walks around, looks at the shuttle, mostly looking to see if there's any dings in the tile, but they're doing quite well walking around. But I'll show you some examples where a crew didn't do so well. This is uh, Jake Garn coming off. This was a 1985 uh, shuttle flight. He was only flew for six days and he can barely, barely walk. He has to be held up. Look at how pale and pasty he is. Um, uh, very ataxic gait. Um, this is uh, John Glenn. He did a nine day mission. He was uh, 77 years old and he has a super wide base gait. He did not walk like that before flight. He recovered after a couple of days, but we took a 77 year old guy that was in really good shape and made him an old man. Here was Shannon Luce and she was 53 after a 180 day uh, mirror mission. And you could see that, and this is a couple of days later. So she's not nearly as bad off as she was immediately post-flight. Um, Record. This was a long um, duration crew just, member. Uh, I uh, actually the, uh, was, he was in really good right shape walking the floor. The, uh, we do a heel to toe uh, test and you can uh, see the, the, the challenges test. that this test, this is why they do it yeah. for field sobriety test. So, so that is, uh, we're just, it's basically just to get an idea where you are. You're doing great. You're doing awesome. Okay. So, so um, and that gets into some of the tests we do. We can do a uh, very, um, quantitatively analyzable uh, um, dynamic platform posturography. And the crew members have been doing this for a number of years, both in the shuttle and space station program. And um, so just to show you where the, the data is in, plotted in different ways, but basically the clinical limit would be at about, um, you know, 85% reduction in performance. And you can see that um, crew members after shuttle flights and then so many hours after wheel stop, most of them are, are very low performers. And then over a period of uh, about 72 to 96 hours, they get back to at least their baseline. One, is, one would be their baseline level. Here's another uh, depiction of it. This was the, a, a different number, but it's the, this is the clinically significant or abnormal limit right here. If you'd never flown in space before, you were uh, on uh, landing day, uh, uh, you, you were um, below a clinically abnormal limit, and this would be your pre-flight uh, performance. With one shuttle flight, you were right at the clinical limit, and with two shuttle flights, you had improved. So there's something about previous spaceflight experience that gives it um, um, an importance to uh, equilibrium and balance. And then for long duration flights, rather than the 72 to 96 hours, it's somewhere between a week and 10 days that they recover back to normal. 
uh, which isn't surprising. Longer exposure to microgravity, longer recovery periods. Now, this is an interesting thing. This test was done with the challenging balance test, the center organization test five with eyes closed. But if you make a head movement, look at how poor your performance is. So what this means is that crew members are still very prone to uh, disequilibrium if they make any uh, head movement. And that's why they walk around with their uh, head stuck on their trunk. Um, th this was a study we did. Uh, basically, it's a field sobriety test that we did on the crew members. And um, the highest uh, problems we found were uh, the heel to toe tandem walk and the uh, uh, ocular stability, which I'll show you pictures of. Now we can do this, you can do it clinically, but what we like to do is measure it uh, with a video camera uh, using an, in, an infrared camera. So the eye is in the dark, so it doesn't have anything to fixate on, which would stabilize it. So we use this system. Um, and I just wanted to show you that if you look at pre-flight in this setting, the um, person is making a, a, a head and eye movement and their eyes should um, match the head movement in the opposite direction and the gaze should stay stable. Now on landing day, you see this uh, very, very uh, perturbed eye movement and these are intrusions of ocular stability. Now I'm gonna do this test on this crew member. This was a shuttle flight right after landing, maybe an hour after landing. And what you're gonna see here is this is a test that's done in the field sobriety test where you just go follow my finger. And ordinarily you'll follow the finger with no perturbations like you see down here, the so-called psychotic intrusions. This is what the policemen are doing when they do that ocular stability tracking task. Look at my, can you see my finger? Yeah. Okay, just kind of follow it like you're- You can't hold his eye track still tracking it. It's jumping all around. Out of you, just let me know. Out of you. And what we traditionally see, these those are, are ocular, uh, those are psychotic and variety tests do. Uh, and that's a very characteristic of cerebellar uh, eye disease. I'll talk a little bit about um, these post uh, G state flashbacks. These are all cases I accumulated in um, my career down there. And they were basically crew members that would be adapted back to normal after their flight. For a shuttle flight, after three days, uh, you know, they can start resuming uh, activities like driving uh, if, they, if they don't have any symptoms. Um, and they can start flying again, uh, probably within a week afterwards. But these were crew members that had been home, returned to normal, and then suddenly developed a, a state like they were immediately um, uh, ataxic uh, immediately after landing. And so we call it a G-state flashback because they were they were they were back they were back to normal, but they suddenly reverted back to their immediate post landing day uh, state. And we had a, all kinds of different scenarios. One was driving a car on a curved ramp and couldn't uh, control the car and had to turn it over to his wife. Another was riding on an escalator and felt like they were being thrown off the escalator. And this other case was a scientific experiment um, that was done. Uh, at uh, eight days over a week after flight, and uh, they'd completely recovered by day five, and they were on this uh, rotating chair device. And um, immediately after that rotating chair device, and it wasn't a particularly uh, noxious one, it was just to, just to test some, some parameters that immediately became uh, back to um, a very low score after that uh, stimulus. And this was the publication that it was published in. Um, some more different uh, flight um, uh, experiences. Um, oftentimes they're in a, some kind of motion environment. One was on an escalator, one was in a car, one was on a, a, a moving platform at a parade. Uh, the crews come back and a couple of weeks after they come back, they go back to various hometowns and do parades. And they were on a basically a, 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 a platform in a parade and they felt uh, acutely unsteady. Uh, one happened when they were flying an airplane. Th three weeks afterwards, we would have thought they'd have been completely normal. So this is just a this is an, an unusual phenomenon. Uh, it's in my book chapter in the uh, Principles of Clinical Medicine for Spaceflight. So in summary, uh, we do see some significant 
uh, challenges to the nervous systems associated with all phases of spaceflight. Some of it is, or most of it is gravito inertial, but it could also be these other phenomena and uh, in environmental perturbations as well. And again, we don't know what neuro the radiation effects are doing. Um, the bottom line is that we're really concerned about effects on human performance, particularly with man in the loop systems or human in the loop systems like controlling a vehicle, doing a rendezvous and docking, doing a robotic arm operation. And the thing that we're really worried about, particularly with the spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome is that we've seen some of these effects, um, optic disc edema and elevated intracranial pressure with lumbar puncture years later. So we're really uh, very concerned about potentially long duration effects. Here's my contact info. Um, we have time for a few questions if you'd like.